I'm Elizabeth Slattery. And I'm Tiffany Bates. And welcome to SCOTUS 101, where we break down what's happening at the Supreme Court, what the justices are up to, and other things related to our favorite branch of government. This week, we're talking about all the new opinions from this week, Justice Thomas dissenting from Justice Thomas, and we sit down with Seventh Circuit Judge Amy Coney Barrett. We know what the court was up to during its winter break. They released eight opinions over the course of this week. Uh, We're not going to talk about all eight uh, because that would take us all afternoon. Mm -hmm. (laughs) But we're going to hit the highlights from some of those decisions. So first up was Hernandez versus Mesa. This was a 5-4 decision by Justice Alito. He was joined by the other conservatives on the court. The court affirmed the Fifth Circuit's dismissal of a lawsuit filed by the parents of a 15-year-old Mexican boy who was killed by a U.S. Border Patrol agent in a disputed cross-border incident. So the agent was standing on U.S. soil when he shot the boy who was standing on Mexican soil after having gone uh, back across the border from the United States. The Supreme Court held the decision in Bivens versus six unknown federal narcotics agents from 1971, authorizing damages lawsuits against federal agents for violations of Fourth and Fifth Amendment rights does not extend to claims based on a cross-border shooting. Expansion of Bivens, which authorized claims against the federal government despite the lack of a federal statute creating such a claim, is as Alito wrote, a disfavored judicial activity. The majority noted that these claims arise in a new context uh, that is significantly different than prior Bivens claims and that several factors counsel hesitation in expanding Bivens remedies here, including the fact that Congress has repeatedly declined to authorize the award of damages against federal officials for injuries inflicted outside of the United States. So under these circumstances, the court found that judges should not create a cause of action that extends across U.S. borders. A Justice Thomas concurred, joined by Justice Gorsuch, saying the court should discard the Bivens doctrine altogether since the foundation for that decision of the practice of creating implied causes of action in the statutory context has already been abandoned by the court. Uh, Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg dissented, joined by Breyer, Sotomayor, and Kagan, saying that the Bivens doctrine should apply to a rogue U.S. officer, even if the impact of the officer's stateside conduct was suffered abroad. Uh, It's a sad case, to be sure. Next up is McKinney versus Arizona, and this was a capital case where the defendant, McKinney, was convicted of two counts of first-degree murder in Arizona State Court and was sentenced to death. At trial, the judge found aggravating circumstances, and he weighed those circumstances against the mitigating circumstances before imposing a death sentence. The Arizona Supreme Court affirmed that sentence, but almost 20 years later, when the case was on habeas review, the Ninth Circuit held that Arizona courts failed to consider McKinney's PT. PTSD, which was relevant mitigating evidence. The case then went back to the Arizona Supreme Court, which independently reweighed the aggravating and mitigating factors pursuant to a case called Clemens versus Mississippi from 1990 and upheld the sentence. McKinney appealed and in a 5-4 opinion by Justice Kavanaugh, joined by the chief, Thomas, Alito and Gorsuch, the court affirmed, holding that Um, state appellate courts may conduct Clemens reweighing of aggravating and mitigating circumstances and may do so on collateral review. So next up was Manaski versus Taglieri. This is a unanimous opinion by Justice Ginsburg holding that determining a child's habitual residence for purposes of an international custody dispute under the Hague Convention depends on the totality of circumstances specific to that case rather than a categorical approach such as whether there was an actual agreement about uh, habitual residence between the parents. So here the petitioner was a U.S. citizen alleging that the respondent, her Italian husband, became abusive after they moved to Italy and she fled to Ohio with their infant daughter. So the respondent petitioned for the child's return to Italy under the Hague Convention, which provides that a child wrongfully removed from her country of habitual residence ordinarily must be returned to that country. Uh, A federal district court granted the petition, concluding that the parent's shared intent uh, was for the child to live in Italy. And on appeal, the Sixth Circuit affirmed, rejecting the petitioner's argument that habitual residence required an actual agreement between the parents. The Supreme Court also affirmed after examining the Hague Convention's text and the context in which the written words were used. Next up is Archdiocese of San Juan versus Feliciano. This is a dispute between the Archdiocese in Puerto Rico and teachers over around $4.7 million in pensions. So the case was in territorial court in Puerto Rico, but then removed to federal court. But despite that, the Puerto Rico Court of First Instance ordered sheriffs to seize assets from the archdiocese in order to pay the teachers um, these pensions that they claimed they're entitled to. 
Uh, so the Supreme Court, in a per curiam opinion, held that the Puerto Rico Court of First Instance lacked jurisdiction to issue payment and seizure orders against the archdiocese because the case had been removed to federal court and not yet remanded back to the Puerto Rican court system. So the court vacated the judgment below, remanded the case for consideration of several different issues, including whether the church and its schools are a single entity for purpose of liability, among other issues. So I expect we'll see that back up at some point unless these peripheral issues um, are resolved in in the correct way. So the next few opinions we're going to go through in rapid review. Uh, First up is Rodriguez versus FDIC. This is a unanimous opinion by Justice Gorsuch. The court held that a federal common law rule for settling certain tax refund disputes is not a legitimate exercise of federal common lawmaking. Then we have Intel Corporation Investment Policy Committee versus Solma. This is also a unanimous opinion by Justice Alito. So the Employee Retirement Income Security Act, or ERISA, requires plaintiffs with actual knowledge of an alleged fiduciary breach to file suit within three years of gaining that knowledge rather than waiting within a six-year period that would otherwise apply. So the question here was whether a plaintiff necessarily has actual knowledge of information contained in disclosures that he receives but doesn't read or can't recall reading. The court held that he does not have actual knowledge, so basically the fine print doesn't count. Then there's Holguin Hernandez versus United States. This was a unanimous opinion by Justice Breyer, and it was involving a criminal defendant uh, preserving a claim of error for appellate review. Finally, there's Schuller versus United States, which is a unanimous opinion by Justice Ginsburg. And here the court was looking at how to determine if a defendant's prior conviction for a serious drug offense under state law qualifies for a 15-year minimum sentence enhancement under the Armed Career Criminal Act. Um, It seems like there's at least one ACCA case every term. At least one. Yeah. (laughs) Uh, So turning to the orders, the court granted cert in one new case, which at this point won't be argued until next term. So that's the term starting in October. It's Fulton versus Philadelphia. Uh, This involves a free exercise challenge brought by Catholic Social Services against the city of Philadelphia. Uh, So Catholic Social Services provides foster care services consistent with the Catholic Church's teachings, and it uh, wouldn't partner with unmarried couples or same-sex couples. So the city opened an investigation into uh, social services, uh, alleged discrimination against gay couples, and ultimately informed social services that its annual contracts, which allowed it to provide foster care services, would not be renewed unless it changed its position and basically got with the times, as um, one of the people in Philadelphia government said. Uh, So this ended up in federal court, and the Third Circuit Court of Appeals upheld the city's action, citing the Supreme Court's ruling in Employment Division versus Smith. So that ruling from 1990 said that free exercise claims must yield to a neutral and generally applicable law or policy. This was a controversial Supreme Court decision that led to the passage of the Religious Freedom Restoration Act. So the issues at SCOTUS are whether free exercise plaintiffs can only succeed by proving a particular type of discrimination claim, namely that the government would allow the same conduct by someone who held different religious views, or whether courts must consider other evidence that a law is not neutral uh, and generally applicable. A second issue is whether uh, the court should revisit Employment Division versus Smith, which is um, a pretty big issue for them to take up. But the uh, the challengers represented by Beckett Fund, I forget how many cases they're up to for this term, but all of the cases. They're, the <laughs> Beckett Fund lawyers are, are are killing it right now. But they, they argue in the cert petition that uh, the Smith decision has just – uh, wrought a lot of uncertainty in the in the lower courts, and so there's uh, some some guidance that the Supreme Court could provide. And then finally, the the final question is whether the government violates the First Amendment by conditioning a religious agency's ability to participate in the foster care system uh, on taking action and making statements that directly contradict the agency's religious beliefs. So now we'll turn to the denials. There were a lot of denials, but there are a couple that had um, dissentals or statements filed by various justices that we wanted to highlight. Yeah. So first up is Patterson versus Walgreen Company. And this was a dispute over the meaning of Title VII's prohibition of employment discrimination because of religion. The court declined to hear this case, um, but Justice Alito, joined by 
Justices Thomas and Gorsuch concurred in the denial of cert, but wrote separately to state that the court should reconsider the proposition that Title VII does not require an employer to make any accommodation for an employee's practice of religion if doing so would impose more than a de minimis burden. So that proposition comes from a 1977 case, Trans World Airlines versus Hardison. And I'm sure Beckett is already working on a cert petition. Because uh, <laughs> this happened last time when, you know, I think it was Justice Alito said, um, you know, nobody's asked us to reconsider Employment Division v. Smith. And like next day, Beckett has a cert petition. <laughs> Way to um, go, Beckett. So <laughs> Next up, another dissent came in Baldwin versus United States. And the question presented was whether the court should overrule National Cable and Telecommunications Association versus Brand X Internet Services, uh, a case better known as Brand X. This is a deference doctrine that grew out of uh, Chevron deference and allows an agency's statutory construction to supersede a court's interpretation in certain situations. So Justice Thomas dissented from the court's denial of cert, writing that Brand X is inconsistent with Article 3 of the Constitution, uh, the Administrative Procedure Act, and traditional tools of statutory interpretation. He wrote, Brand X takes on the constitutional deficiencies of Chevron and exacerbates them and gives agencies, quote, the power to effectively overrule judicial presidents and neutralize a previously exercised check on the executive branch by the judiciary. So Thomas actually wrote the court's decision in Brand X and is in his dissental this week. He said, although I authored Brand X, it is never too late to surrender former views to a better considered position. Uh, so this is just continuing the drumbeat from several members of the court that Chevron deference is a problem they need to address and that it has created all of these subsequent deference doctrines that are equally problematic. Thomas descending from Thomas. Citing Thomas. <laughs> Finally, we have Arizona versus California, which I was most pumped about. And nobody <laughs> else is. So this is a case about California's extraterritorial tax assignment enforcement, but that's not the exciting part. Um, because this is a case between two states, it's an original jurisdiction case, which means it doesn't fall under the court's appellate jurisdiction, which is completely discretionary. So instead of filing cert, um, for a cert petition, Arizona had to file a motion for leave to file a bill of complaint. Um, the court denied that, but Justice Thomas, joined by Justice Alito, dissented from denial, writing that we likely do not have discretion to decline review in cases within our original jurisdiction that arise between two or more states. So Arizona had once again asked the court to reconsider whether it must hear certain original jurisdiction cases. So since the 1970s, the court has held that it has discretion whether or not to hear certain categories of cases brought under the court's original jurisdiction. But there's a lot of evidence that they don't actually have discretion to decline to hear cases between two states. Um, well, what, you know, where else are the states supposed to go? <laughs> yeah, um, because the court has original and exclusive jurisdiction um, over those cases. And um, as Chief Justice Marshall said in Cohen's versus Virginia in 1821, the court has no more right to decline the exercise of jurisdiction, which is given, than to usurp that, which it is not given. Um, Thomas and Alito have teamed up before to raise this issue. So in Nebraska versus Colorado from 2016, um, they issued a similar dissental uh, saying that because the court's discretionary approach appears to be at odds with the statutory text, it bears reconsideration. And so this is like the original jurisdiction issue that excites me the most. And I was very excited to see this. You know, and these original jurisdiction cases between states, they can go on for decades. There's one, I, I believe it's between Texas and Arizona, that's going to be argued um, later this term, sometime in April. And I was looking at the docket, and it goes back to the 1970s. I mean, this litigation has been going on for for years, so definitely an interesting area. Yeah, and um, in a lot of recent cases, states, particularly Arizona and I think Missouri, have really tried the, to get the court to um, talk about this discretion issue. And I think it's really interesting. So the court also heard four oral arguments this week. Uh, the most noteworthy moment was following uh, one argument. The chief justice asked Paul Clement to come back up to the lectern, and he congratulated uh, Clement on his 100th argument, uh, saying it's a rare milestone and that Paul has performed in an exemplary manner on behalf of all of his clients, including the federal government, uh, for a number of years. And the chief concluded saying the justices will see him again next week uh, as the court appointed him to defend the CFPB in a case challenging the constitutionality of its structure. 
That's great. But I cannot imagine being recalled back to the podium um, by the chief justice. I wonder if he didn't like think anything of it or if he was like scared to death immediately. When the chief like getting like, called to the principal's <laughs> office. <laughs> yeah. Please approach the podium. <laughs> well, next up, uh, we recently spoke with Judge Amy Coney Barrett. We're delighted to have Amy Coney Barrett in the studio with us today. Judge Barrett is a judge on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Seventh Circuit. Welcome to SCOTUS 101. Thank you for having me. So let's start off with your early career. Following law school, you clerked for Judge Silberman on the D.C. Circuit. So what were some of the highlights of that clerkship? Oh, it was a great job, and I learned so much from Judge Silberman. You know, that was my first job out of law school. So I started in July after having graduated in May. So I was definitely pretty green and clerking for a formidable judge who was as smart um, as Judge Silberman really taught me a lot. I think um, I've always been tough. Judge Silberman definitely made me tougher. I mean, you know, here you are, a brand new baby lawyer, and you're having to go back and forth about cases with someone who's very experienced. Um He is formidable. He really can grasp issues and cases very clearly and write clearly and quickly. I mean, he can get his reasoning to paper. Um, So, you know, that that was just a great experience. And I have to say, you know, he spent time as the undersecretary of labor earlier in his career. And the labor cafeteria is close to the D.C. Circuit. (laughs) So, you know, he, he really taught me the importance of being a mentor, and some of that happened through the many lunches he liked to take us to at the labor cafeteria, um, where I would not call the food a highlight, but the conversation (laughs) was. Um, He also liked the old AB pizza, and that was uh, a lot more um, fun from the menu side of things. So, Mm -hmm. you know, Judge Silberman, he sat behind me at my confirmation hearing, and he swore me in at my investiture ceremony. So, you know, he's been a very important um, mentor in my life. And then you went on to clerk at the Supreme Court for Justice Scalia. So can you tell us a little about your time in his chambers? Yes. So, you know, that is trial by fire. You get thrown in and, you know, it it's an overwhelming amount of work. You know, you're feeling your way at first. Justice Scalia participated in the cert pool. So you start in the summer and you're thrown into writing memos that you know will be circulated at the time eight of the nine justices were in the cert pool. So it's a little stressful when you, you know, realize you're writing things that eight Supreme Court justices are going to be reading. And then when the merits cases started in October, you know, those are the hardest cases. They're there because they're hard enough that they've divided lower courts. So those were very challenging. And the way Justice Scalia ran his chambers is we all had to be prepared to discuss all the cases. So we would have a conference before argument where the four of us would be in his office. And then you're just going toe to toe, everybody saying what they think. Um, and, you know, Justice Scalia, obviously, you know, very quick witted, brilliant. And, you know, you, you had to be he didn't want you to agree with him. He wanted you to say what you thought. And so disagreeing with him, as I sometimes did, and and pushing back and going back and forth with someone like Justice Scalia really taught me a lot, taught me a lot about oral advocacy and being articulate, and who better to learn um, how to write uh, under than someone who was as great a writer as he was. So it was a great year. And I should say, I would be remiss if I didn't say that in both years, another highlight was the great co-clerks that I had. Before we move on, How did the SCOTUS cafeteria compare to the labor departments? Better, but I mean, it's not a place I'd choose for a date night. (laughs) (laughs) Well, uh, Tiffany and I have plans to go over and check out the the new uh, menu item, which is pizza at the Supreme Court cafeteria at some point. Yes, and I, and I haven't been there since the newer justices have made improvements. So, <laughs> uh, so then after your clerkships, you worked at a big firm for a few years, and then spent the next fifteen or so years teaching at Notre Dame Law School, mm-hmm. uh, where you are still teaching. Uh, so, what are some of your favorite classes to teach? So, I taught a lot of classes. You know, I, I've been a professor for a long time, so I've taught civil procedure and federal courts and constitutional law seminar in statutory interpretation, one in constitutional theory, and I teach evidence. And I really love teaching all of them for different reasons. Um, My scholarship focused primarily on public law, so teaching federal courts and constitutional law and my seminars in interpretation, those were, you know, my primary areas of scholarly interest, and they're easy to get students engaged in. Those are the kinds of subjects that students are really eager to engage with. Um, So I loved teaching those classes. Um, You know, I love teaching civil procedure, too. That is a different challenge. Um, First year, first semester, students don't always 
understand why civil procedure is so important when it seems so boring. Um, <laughs> some of my, you know, my evaluations, my teaching evaluations at the end of civil procedure, you know, would say things like, wow, I'm so impressed you could make such a boring subject so interesting, <laughs> which I counted as a triumph. Um, but it's really fun to teach first semester, first year students and be one of their introductions to law school. And, you know, civil procedure is something that's the day in, you know, day out bread of a litigator as, you know, Tiffany, now you're at a law firm. I'm sure you're seeing that. Um, evidence, I like teaching, but that was a surprise. I offered to teach evidence because we needed it. Um, mm -hmm. Nobody was teaching it at the time, so I did it to help out. And it is totally different than the other classes that I teach. <laughs> and it was a lot of fun because I could use film clips and problems, and I would have the students argue motions in class. So, you know, I, I continue to teach. I teach my two seminars, and it's not practical because of my sitting schedule in Chicago to teach have class on more than one day in a week, so I can't teach any of the mm -hmm. big classes anymore, but I, I miss it. I love the big classes as well as the seminars. That's great. And you've lived in South Bend, Indiana for a number of years now. What are some of your favorite spots around town? Well, Notre Dame obviously looms large <laughs> in South Bend, and we just live three blocks from campus. So in the summer, that's where I go running. I go running on campus, and there are two really beautiful lakes on campus that I go running around. And in the football season, our football mm -hmm. Saturdays are spent tailgating. We walk up, and we, with um, some friends of ours, for many years, we had a um, antique vintage fire truck that we painted green, and we would have <laughs> tailgates where all the kids could be running around playing football out on the green. Um, so we, at one point, considered moving to a neighborhood a little farther from campus, and our kids really rebelled because they love the proximity to campus, too. Um, one thing about South Bend that people might not know um, who haven't been there before is that it's actually very close to Michigan. And so Lake Michigan and the Michigan beach towns are just a little more than a half an hour away. So my family and I like going up in the summer to the beaches or, you know, there are fun restaurants in the little beach towns. One of the jokes around Notre Dame is that if Father Soren, who was the founder of the university, had just kept traveling a little farther north, the geography would have been better. <laughs> as, as a Michigander, I can confirm that. So uh, your husband is also a lawyer, no slouch. Uh, he's a, a former assistant U.S. attorney, and now he's at a firm, and he also teaches at Notre Dame. So can you tell me how have you and your husband balanced raising seven children with your very busy careers? Well, part of the reason is my very wonderful husband. I mean, we are totally a team and we share the responsibility. We divide up doctor's appointments and orthodontist appointments and dentist appointments. You know, there's obviously a lot to do, but in no sense do I bear the lion's share of it. So him, um, his being so willing to help has really made it all possible. And, you know, sometimes when people hear that we have seven kids, they imagine seven infants. <laughs> but, you know, obviously there is, thank goodness, an age spread. Our oldest is in college and our youngest is in second grade. So we have a range and, and we got another driver in the house on Saturday. We were without a driver for a while when our oldest daughter left home. And I can tell you it is a cause for celebration in a busy family when you have mm -hmm. someone else who can help drive kids to school. So, you know, South Bend, we have many, many friends. It's a very warm community and a great place to raise a family. So we have carpooling help. I mean, it's true. My my husband once described my Google calendar as like a cubist painting because it has so many different colors and blocks yeah. on it. His looks like that, too. <laughs> so it's definitely busy. Um, but, you know, we've been fortunate to have good child care and good friends. That's wonderful. I, I have... Uh two kids and my, my Google calendar is starting to take on many, <laughs> many different colors as well. <laughs> so now that you're a judge on the Seventh Circuit, how has the transition been um, from the academic world to the bench? Well, in some ways, the academic world is good preparation for what I do now because academics spend a lot of their time reading and writing. And that's the way that I spend the bulk of my days now is reading and researching and writing. You know, and as an academic, I spent a lot of time mentoring students, and now I have a smaller group. You know, I have my four law clerks. Um, so in many respects, there are things that are the same. But obviously, you know, there, there's a big difference between writing law review articles and writing judicial opinions. Mm -hmm. uh, as a law professor, I sometimes wondered whether anyone read or cared about any of the articles that I published in law reviews. But when I write a judicial opinion, I know that there are at least two people, you know, the litigants, who will care very much what I write. And I'm keenly aware that um, I'm exercising the judicial power of the United States, and it's, it's a heavy responsibility, and that's quite different. 
being a public servant is quite different, you know, than than being a private citizen, um, even engaged in the service of of teaching students. So I think the responsibility is is very different. And that was a very big transition. So shifting gears a bit, uh, your faith has been a subject of quite a bit of scrutiny. It came up during your confirmation hearing, and you said that a judge may never subvert the law or twist it in any way to match the judge's convictions. I think you sort of became a meme with the, the dogma lives loudly. So could you talk a little bit about how judges handle any conflicts between their faith and what the job requires? Well, the statement that you just quoted from my confirmation hearing is what I believe, and it's my been my consistent position ever since I was a law student when I wrote with my um, professor the law review article that got so much scrutiny during my confirmation process. Um, I don't think that faith should influence the way a judge decides cases at all. You know, as I said, I don't think that a judge should twist the law to bring it into line or to help it match in any way the judge's own convictions. And that's true whether they derive from faith or, you know, everyone has convictions. Everyone has beliefs. That's not unique to people who have faith. Um, and so somehow people seem to have think that I said the opposite <laughs> of what I said. Um, but I, I think that one of the most important responsibilities of a judge is to put their personal preferences and their personal beliefs aside because our responsibility is to adhere to the rule of law. So switching gears again, are there anything you'd like to do with your, your clerks? I've heard some chambers have you know a pancake eating contest or ping pong matches, field trips to historic sites. Is there anything like that in the Barrett chambers? Well, I'm only on my third batch of clerks, so it might be early to call anything a tradition, but I can tell you some of the things that we've enjoyed doing. So I'm from New Orleans, even though I've been living in Indiana for uh, 15 or 16 years now. So uh, when I was, and I got this idea from Justice Scalia, during the Scalia clerkship, he would always have us over to his home um, for dinner once during the clerkship year. And we all really enjoyed that and we look forward to getting to know him in a different setting. And so that is something that I have done and will continue to do with my clerks. And I clerk them a New Orleans meal. So (laughs) depending on what seafood Jesse and I have been able to bring back from New Orleans and dietary restrictions of the clerks and their partners, you know, my staples are gumbo and red beans and rice and jambalaya and bread pudding souffle, one of our favorites. <laughs> mm. um, so we do that. And then we've done some activities. This year we had a new one. Um, we went and shot sporting clays at a range that was up in Michigan. And that was so fun. We really enjoyed that. And so we're going to go again when the weather warms up. It's not really sporting clays weather right now <laughs> in, in South Bend or Michigan. So we're going to do that again in the spring or summer when it warms up. And I would say other than that, you know, in my chambers, I am located in a bankruptcy court because that's where they had space for me. And while court of appeals judges don't need their own courtrooms, bankruptcy judges do. So I have a courtroom in my chambers. And that is a place where, you know, we eat lunch there regularly. I try to eat with the clerks um, at least once a week. um, And and they eat in there most days, except when they go out on Taco Tuesdays to the Mexican, (laughs) uh, the Mexican grocery store and restaurant that's uh, nearby chambers. So I think just spending time with clerks in chambers, trying to have lunch with them and and, you know, some of our outings like this. So you mentioned you're a runner. Do clerks ever run with you? They do not. So I I am not as brave as Judge Hardiman to do marathon training (laughs) with my law clerk. So no, they don't. Do you have anything in your chambers that reflects your personality or where you're from? Well, let's see. So I I mentioned that in the courtroom, we have a lot of space. And one of the things that we have been able to put in there because we have so much space is a foosball table that's on loan for my children for (laughs) chambers. Um, This batch of clerks has not played it uh, too much. Last group of clerks enjoyed it more. Um, And then in Chambers, Notre Dame fans will be familiar with the blue and gold sign that says, play like a champion today. It hangs in the staircase that the football players run through when they go up onto the field and they all tap it as they go by. And my friend Judge Willett on the Fifth Circuit sent me a gold and blue sign that says, judge like a champion today. (laughs) And so I have that hanging up in Chambers and it's a, a splash of Judge Willett, fun and humor in a setting that's otherwise pretty formal. And I, I will say about the the courtroom, my children love to come, not just to visit their foosball table, but, you know, they love climbing up on the bench and 
they, you know, their father was a prosecutor for many years. They like to write out indictments for one another. <laughs> so I, I will sometimes find legal pads with, the, you know, the indictments for crimes that they've made up that the others have committed on the bench. So that's been an amusing part of Chambers. That's great. Um, so one final question. If you could have a conversation with any Supreme Court justice, living or dead, who would you pick and what would you talk about? It is hard to narrow down because there are obviously so many men and women who have served on the court who would be interesting to talk to. But I recently read Evan Thomas's excellent biography of Justice Mm O'Connor. So I will say Justice O'Connor. I have met Justice O'Connor before. But, you know, not in this kind of setting that you're envisioning where you get to sit down and and really talk to her. And, you know, who wouldn't and certainly what woman wouldn't want to hear her talk about the stories of breaking in, not just to the among the brethren, right, on the Mm -hmm. Supreme Court, but also into the legal profession. I thought, you know, the the Thomas biography did such a nice job um, of talking about her personal life and experiences. Some judicial biographies are very heavy on describing the opinions and reading more about her experience and her life um, just made me eager to get to know her better. And it also gave me a sense of gratitude because my experience professionally has been so different than hers. You know, remember, she could only get hired as a secretary even mm-hmm. after graduating at the top of her class. And, you know, I'm the first woman from Indiana to sit on the Seventh Circuit in one of the Indiana seats. And that's really hardly worth notice because <laughs> nobody really thinks it's odd to have a woman on the court. People don't bat an eye when it's, you know, three women um, from the Seventh Circuit who are on a panel. And, you know, that's because of women like Justice O'Connor. But I have to add, so I know that it is against your rules to say John Marshall, (laughs) but in the spirit of current events, I recently learned, so I knew that he was the chief during the impeachment of Justice Chase, but I did not know until recently that he actually testified in the Senate during the impeachment trial because he had overheard a conversation between Justice Chase and Justice Bushrod Washington that was relevant. So he had to send a deposition to the House during the investigation, and he testified in the trial. And then remember, on the circuit, he also presided over the trial for treason of Aaron Burr. Mm -hmm. So thinking about how he established an independent judiciary when he navigated through those kinds of stressful and, and fraught partisan times, that would be something worth hearing about. In addition, obviously, to all the other interesting things you could talk to John Marshall about. Yeah, that's fascinating. I had not heard that about uh, Chief Justice Marshall. So we'll we'll allow that answer to uh, to stand. Thank you. (laughs) Well, Judge Barrett, thank you so much for joining us. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. We'll wrap up with an edition of Supreme Trivia, the Dogma Lives Loudly edition. So we've got some religious-themed questions for you. I think they're pretty easy, though. Well, so. Lent is starting this week, so it seems it seems it's appropriate. True. It's very appropriate. First up, this Supreme Court justice dreamed of being a Catholic priest when he was younger. He attended multiple Catholic boarding schools um, and seminary before eventually heading off to university. Justice Thomas. Yes. <laughs> the, a real softball. Um, I mostly included this question so we could give another shout-out that people should go see... His documentary, Created Equal, in his own words, because um, it's really great. You should go see it. And I think if if you've missed the opportunity to see it in theaters, I believe PBS is going to be running it later this year on TV. Is that right? Yes, but it's still in various theaters. Okay, so, so go to the theater and see it, and then when it comes out on PBS, watch it every time yes. that it's on PBS. Yes, exactly. Next question. Of the nine current justices, how many are Catholic? And out of the total number of justices, which I believe is 114 at this point, um, how many have been Catholic? Okay, so I think it's six current ones that are Catholic. So hold on, let me let me okay. let me walk through it. So the Chief Justice Alito, Thomas, Gorsuch, kind of counts because he was raised Catholic, right? But now he's Episcopalian. Yes. Okay. Um, Kavanaugh. So mm-hmm. that's five. Um, and then who am I missing? Well, does Sotomayor count? I mean, I, I think she's talked about how she was raised Catholic. Yeah, so I, I counted her. Okay, so that's... Um, but I did not count Gorsuch because he is Episcopalian now, but... Okay, how about five and a half? Okay, <laughs> sounds good. Um, and historically, how many historically, Catholic justices total? Oh, gosh. Um, 
So not that many. Uh, can I give you like a range? Yeah. Uh, let's say like less than 20. Okay, yeah, you're definitely in the range. So there were 14. Um, and one of those, Sherman Minton, apparently converted after leaving the court. Oh, interesting. Um, yeah, so historically not a huge representation. I think um, he was from, I don't know if he was from Kentucky. He had some sort of connection to Kentucky because there's a, a bridge between Louisville and um, southern Indiana, the Sherman Minton Bridge. Oh, really? Yeah. That's so funny. I, I you know, like didn't know he was a Supreme Court justice until, you know. <laughs> Just now? And No, until we started oh. doing, you know, started doing trivia and like researching these things a couple years ago. So oh, that's great. OK, next up. These two Supreme Court justices graduated from the same Jesuit all boys boarding school where some of the Kennedys also attended. Is it a boarding school? Uh, Gorsuch and Kavanaugh. Yeah, I guess it's not. Maybe yes, maybe it, maybe it is. But you're right. Maybe it's Shout not. Shout out to Nyla. Yes. Um, well, yes. it's at least an all boys Catholic school. It's true. Jesuit, you said, right? Yes. I went to Jesuit school. It was, it was <laughs> it's going to soft spot. Tricky Jesuits. Yeah. <laughs> yes. So switching gears a little bit, we're going to talk about some of the Jewish justices. All right. So who was the first Jewish justice appointed to the Supreme Court? Was it Brandeis? Or yes. Fra- okay. Uh-huh. And then Frank Furter was a couple years. And Brandeis, wasn't he the first one? Um, where there was a confirmation hearing, and it was because there were some anti-Semitic overtones to that hearing, but he didn't actually appear at the hearing. Yeah, right? I think I think that was him. Okay. Yes, okay. yes, good job. And our follow-up and last question: How many Jewish justices total have there been? I think even fewer than Catholic. But let me let me think. So there was Brandeis and Frankfurter and Fortis, mm-hmm. um, Ginsburg, Breyer. Breyer's yeah, one. yeah, mm-hmm. Breyer and Kagan. Mm-hmm. So that's we're up to six. I'm going to round up and say eight. Yeah, there is eight. Oh wow! Okay, um, you got all. So who did I forget? <laughs> so there's Louis Brandeis, Benjamin Cardozo. Oh, oh my gosh! Of course, <laughs> Felix Frankfurter, Arthur Goldberg. Oh, okay, Abe Fortas, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, Stephen Breyer, and Elena Kagan. Um, and I was looking up these questions, and um, I saw there's a book. Uh, pretty recently from a couple years ago called Jewish Justices of the Supreme Court from Brandeis to Kegan, Their Lives and Legacies by David Dallin, um, which looked like an interesting read. Oh, well, maybe it would be a good place to find more trivia yeah. for future episodes. Yeah, I think it, I think it would. We're going to have to get it. Um, well, good job. I think you got them all right. That might so. be a first. Uh, that's definitely a first <laughs> for me. Well, thanks for listening to SCOTUS 101. Be sure to subscribe on Spotify, iTunes, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. And please leave us a five-star rating. Please also follow us on Twitter at SCOTUS 101. And you can email us at SCOTUS 101 at heritage.org with questions, comments, or ideas for future episodes. You've been listening to SCOTUS 101, brought to you by more than half a million members of the Heritage Foundation. Executive produced by Elizabeth Slattery. Sound designed by Lauren Evans, Thalia Rampersad, and Mark Guiney. For more information, visit heritage.org.